Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner and I'm here today with Professor Shivaraj Kapal for today's webinar, Cybersecurity for Executives, Navigating the Landscape of Potential Threats. Before I introduce Shiva, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. As you'll see on your screen, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, most importantly, Please submit those questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Shiva Rajkapal. He is the Kester and Burns Professor of Accounting and Auditing at Columbia Business School and the Faculty Director of our new Leading Cybersecurity in Your Organization program. He is a world-renowned expert on financial reporting issues, earnings quality, fraud, executive compensation, corporate culture, and corporate governance. He has been internationally recognized for his scholarship on several occasions, and he is passionate about bridging academic theory with policy setting and corporate practice and has wide ranging experience in solving applied business problems. He also advises think tanks, advisory firms, and professional and trade associations. Shiva, I always love working with you. Great to be with you today. I'm going to leave the stage and I'll rejoin you in the last 10 minutes. Oh, it's a pleasure, Scott, as always. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thanks to everyone uh, who took the time to come and listen to the, you know, it's an interesting emerging conversation that we all need to have about cyber risks. So my plan for today is to, uh, you know, touch on a few important questions. What does the overall landscape look like? What does a typical hack look like? Has uh, cyber already become a systemic risk, especially if you are a bank or you run a payment systems process or something along those lines, maybe a utility? Should or should we not pay ransomware? Because this became an important conversation, if you remember, during the, 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 the colonial pipeline issue. Uh, most important, I'm sure this is what uh, you know. many of you are concerned about, what would an effective detection and response plan look like? Uh, there are several legal and disclosure issues associated with the breach as well. Uh, and uh, last but not least, how should we think about cyber from an ROI standpoint? You know, uh, budgets are not limitless. So, you know, how does one come up with a way to think about, you know, when should you optimally take some risk and not eliminate it completely? Because if you try to eliminate risk completely and you know you can just look at what's what we are going through as a society with trying to do zero COVID. look at new zealand and look at australia it's very very expensive to do zero anything so that's another conversation we should have at the end and then i'm um, happy to take questions so what does a typical hack look like uh, but before we go there uh, i thought just to kind of get us get a sense for the scale of the of the threat that we face uh, so just go look at the csis's website this is the center for strategic and international studies they have a fairly careful process to identify and uh, document the various cyber threats that we are seeing and this is an excerpt just for the month of october 2021 you know a chinese linked hacking group gained access to calling records and text messages from telecom carriers across the globe. You know, another attack targeted at uh, government issued uh, electronic cards in Iran. Another Iran attack, Brazilian hackers, the uh, hack into the Israeli defense ministry. An American company announced that a Russian intelligence uh, service has launched a campaign targeting resellers and so on. So, you know, I don't have to convince you that this is becoming a very big problem you know, at, at all kinds of levels, the levels of small businesses, large businesses, uh, you know, governmental entities, NGOs, countries, etc. You know, so, uh, so what can you do about this as a, as a board or a CXO? So one has to educate oneself as best as one can. So what does a typical hack look like? So here are a few typical examples, you know, the technician uploads a patch and goes off to Disneyland. Uh, to take his kids out for a, for a vacation, except once he leaves, nobody can talk him. What do you do? You know, something more common that we've all experienced, maybe, I hope not, but uh, at least some of us have, the, the whole malware infection issue. Increasingly, now you see uh, folks who are called hacktivists. So these are uh, sometimes 
socially active uh, folks who want to you know communicate a message to the company uh, by shutting a, shutting down their cyber systems so for instance if you have a green group that uh, you know has an issue with say an oil company or a coal company you could expect maybe an attack on their systems this is this is this is getting very very common uh, the outside cloud provider issue is another interesting problem. Uh, you know, regardless of who you are with, uh, AWS or someone else, uh, you know, attacks on the cloud are also becoming fairly common. Uh, financial break-ins are even harder to detect. In fact, I had one in my uh, credit card bills, you know, because they start stealing a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. Sometimes you don't notice that. And when you least expect it, you're going to get a massive credit card charge. Uh, the, the credit card fraud systems are pretty good, but they still slip, slip through. So another example of financial break-in would be a case where you just add dummy employees to your payroll and somebody is siphoning money off. And if your control systems are not good, it's probably going to take a long time to figure this out. There is virtually no chance of getting the money back. And uh, of course, ransomware attack on your computer systems, which is also quite common. So these are at least a few examples, and there are many more one can think of, of uh, how a typical uh, hack tends to look in the, in the corporate setup. Uh, has cyber become a systemic risk? You know, I think it already has. It's, 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 it's a risk that's affecting the entire economy. Uh, and I would say national security as well. Uh, geopolitics is certainly a concern and state actors are a huge, huge factor. You know, I mean, how can an individual company muster the resources to fight state actors? It's not going to, you know, it's, it's not possible. You know, it's like, it's like expecting, uh, you know, Citibank to wage war against North Korea. You just can't do it, you know, and, and so, especially if you're in sensitive, vulnerable industries such as uh, you know, uh, banking systems, say the New York Stock Exchange, um, networks, if you're a cloud provider like AWS or uh, you know, IBM, uh, if you're running a utility, you know, th th these are these are and, and these attacks have been going on, especially on uh, you know utilities and power systems for a while now. They've been fairly under the radar. But now I think the attacks have become more brazen, bolder, larger for higher stakes. Uh, in fact, you know, if, if there is one thing that a board could do is to lobby uh, the U.S. government to come up with some kind of international coordinated response on this issue. You know, you, you almost need something like a Geneva Convention for, uh, for cyber. You know, it's become such a big concern, especially if you happen to uh, be on the board of or work for one of these large networked uh, businesses like uh, banks or exchanges or utilities. The ransomware question. So this is a, a fascinating case study. So you can go pull this up if you haven't heard of uh, Colonial Pipeline. So they actually paid a ransom in June 2021. And all kinds of interesting managerial questions come up. You know, should you pay a ransom if you're attacked? Now the worry, uh, this is almost like a, you know, a, a kidnap hostage kind of situation, right? Uh, except in that world, you know, once you get the kidnapped child back, if you pay the ransom, hopefully that won't happen again. But the worry in the cyber world is that the attacker is going to come back for second and third and fourth dips. So they just don't go away. Uh, so so that, that's certainly a concern. Uh, and we've already referred to the, uh, you know, hacking by uh, political or, uh, you know, social activists. Uh, so if, you, if, you're, if your company is an ESG concern for some reason, so yes, let's say uh, oil, coal, tobacco, guns, et cetera, then ch chances are that you're probably even more vulnerable than uh, some of the other companies. Uh, so how, how do you deal with this? The, you know, the, the best way to deal with this is to get uh, these the so-called white hat hackers. Effectively, you pay people to come and attack your system. This is what Amazon's been doing for a long time. It's such, a, it's such an amazing idea. Right, you, you turn all the negative energy uh, on itself, effectively, and then you come back and uh, you know just 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 I'll pay you to come to come fight me or attack me because it helps me 
uh, understand where I'm weak and what, what I'm vulnerable about, and then it helps me fix those issues. So th th that's one response. But if you're a small business, obviously you don't have the resources to you know, pay these uh, white hat type hackers. Cyber risk insurance is increasingly also becoming a viable option. Uh, hopefully you can uh, afford that. But if not, if you're a small business, the big concern is that it's a double whammy. You don't have the financial and perhaps the, the labor, the intellectual labor to kind of help you deal with this problem. But you're also likely to be very exposed because you're using somebody else's systems. Think about the whole value chain. You know, you're plugged into your suppliers, perhaps you're plugged into customers. You know, this, this thing can come from anywhere. So the small businesses especially need to do some serious thinking about their response to this problem because they are both vulnerable and are not resourced enough. Uh, detection and response plans. So practically speaking, what can we do? I mean, we can talk about lots of uh, ideas, but here are a few. First, you need a, you need a procedure. You know, just like, uh, you know, we go through these fire drills when the, when the fire alarm goes off uh, or maybe an earthquake drill if you're on the, on the west coast of the U.S., you need a, a cyber a template readiness procedure. If, if something hits, what do I do? Because then, you know, I can do all my careful thinking ahead of time. I have a playbook. More important, we've trained employees on the playbook. So it minimizes the risk of escalation. Uh, you know, and descent into chaos. If you have a, a ready a template to try to figure out what to do when, when something like this happens. Increasingly, to me, this is a, a cultural problem. You know, it has to start from the C-suite. The C-suite has to be educated to stay prepared for an imminent attack. And it's sadly only a matter of uh, when, not if, uh, because you're almost certainly going to get hacked. Uh, so are we are we prepared? And more important, you need a security and a data culture throughout the company. And it usually starts at the top. Once the top has buy-in, once they give you resources, then you know things start percolating pretty quickly uh, throughout the company. And and I can't emphasize this behavioral issue enough. You know, the typically you're only as good as the weakest link uh, in the chain. And remember. Think of the whole ecosystem. It's not just you. Uh, it's anybody who plugs into you uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an electronic sense. So it's, it's staff. You know, think about all the people who are working from home. It's customers because increasingly, you know, it's, it's very efficient and productive from a business standpoint to give customers sometimes access to your, to your own systems. It's suppliers. It could be... Uh, outsourced coding companies a lot of the coding sometimes gets done uh, elsewhere so you know once you once you you know uh, cut and paste that code onto your own systems you know chaos could ensue so it, maybe can you come up with a walled garden or some kind of space where the, uh, the outside coders can leave their code uh, before vetting is done etc so uh, you know it's, so I would encourage a systemic in the sense of, you know, looking at the entire value chain kind of perspective instead of trying to be a bit narrow, because this is something that can come at you from anywhere. You know, some companies like MasterCard actually have a cyber war room. You know, this is similar to the, the, the Wolf Blitzer, CNN war room, if you've seen, uh, if, you, if you watch CNN, especially when these, uh, you know, conflicts erupt, like the, the, the Gulf War and so on. So you almost need a cyber war room a dedicated resource, uh, assuming you have the money to devote to this, obviously, uh, and assuming it's such a big problem for you. Like say, if you're running MasterCard, you're running Visa, you're running Citibank, uh, you almost need a response, something like a cyber war. And just like the White House uh, gets a CIA briefing Monday morning, you need your CEO to get a, a Monday morning cyber briefing something along those lines, because it's become that important. The, the, the CEO needs to keep an eye on it every week. Uh, you know, what did we experience the, you know, the, in the last week? How are we doing on behavioral changes? You know, so the other best practice I've heard, uh, especially from MasterCard and Visa, is that they give you electronic badges for good behavior. You know, uh, the, I'm sure most of you who do gaming realize you know, it's, it can be really motivating sometimes to get these electronic badges. You know, uh, it, it, it's not money, but it's recognition, especially peer and social recognition. So you need something at the cultural behavioral level 
uh, to address this concern and to make sure that everybody in the in in the, in, in the company uh, understands this uh, as best as possible at a gut level and even if they don't uh, at least they go through checklists procedures you have positive uh, you know uh, carrots to reward good behavior like virtual badges or you know something along those lines uh, legal and disclosure issues uh, surrounding cyber threats especially if you are a public company this is uh, quite a big headache you know, because if you disclose something to the market, the market freaks out quickly. And uh, not only that, the other side understands that you've detected them in the system. So sometimes when people hack, it's sometimes useful to just observe, you know, what the, the hacker is doing, uh, because you can learn more about probably preventing more damage later. But from a securities litigation standpoint, you know, when is the right time to, to, to tell the SEC and to tell the market that you've had an attack is, is, is frankly quite challenging. You know, uh, in, in the US at least, there are reporting procedures to uh, report attacks after the fact. In fact, that's how the CIS, uh, CSIS manages to get data and compile them. Uh, but by and large, there are, you know, all kinds of uh, disclosure standards that are not common. They don't talk to each other, so we need something common. Uh, and the other issue with an attack is that, you know, several companies report that there's a negative competitive effect. So, for example, when Target gets attacked, they actually lose market share. People start going to Walmart or somebody else. So this costs real cash flows, real dollars. There's a product market impact. There's an employee recruiting kind of impact because the company's image gets hurt. It's usually hard to find uh, good employees sometimes when these things happen. So this is not some kind of random technical, you know, isolated incident. It seems to have impact in both the labor market and the product market. So that's something to think about when we have our conversation about the ROI. You know, what's the return on my investment? Uh, the other even deeper worry which is, which is kind of emerging now, is that there is some evidence that um, cyber criminals actually short your stock so before, before they launch an attack because they are hoping and praying that you, you, you make this public, it's big enough, or at least the press picks up on it. The stock price tanks 10, 15%. You've made lots of money. And sometimes it's hard to trace these uh, trades uh, because these folks are sitting, I don't know, somewhere, maybe in Eastern Europe, Lithuania, maybe on a boat in international waters and you can't find them. So, you know, so if you're a public company, you'd also worry about this, this other new problem where uh, this is systematic, malicious, uh, and they may not even make a ransomware demand because, you know, effectively they've made money on the market by, by shorting your stock when the bad news comes out. So something else to worry about if you're a, you know, an investor relations person or a CFO uh, is, is, this, is this, you know, this, this, the shorting idea. Uh, and finally, uh, and but last but not least, this this idea of uh, can we reduce uh, investments in cyber risk to you know a standard paradigm like a cost benefit paradigm, uh, you know, a DCF, but a discounted cash flow paradigm. It's difficult to do, but the, but it's important to have this conversation. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, zero risk is prohibitively expensive. There's no such thing as zero risk in the world. Even zero COVID, as you, as I alluded to earlier, has kind of badly failed in, in Australia and New Zealand. They tried that for a while; it was brilliant. But then, if you insist on zero COVID, there are so many other collateral costs. Very similar conversation with with cyber. You know, uh, how how to think about how much money to spend on detection, response, emerging technologies, because there are so many consulting firms out there. You know, it can easily become uh, you know, an endless bleed uh, in terms of how to spend, how to pick the right vendors. So those are those are conversations that people need to have uh, at at a, at, a, at a fairly serious level. And uh, you know, you need to construct a business case for what is considered acceptable risk as opposed to zero risk, and accordingly decide how much money are we willing to spend to 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 mitigate the risk because you're never going to make it zero. Uh, so. You know, for instance, how much money do you want to spend to make sure that your suppliers are fortified versus you? How much money do you want to spend to make sure that your customers are fortified? Sometimes that's not, it's not easy to do. How much risk are you willing to eat because of this? So those are some conversations that need to be had. Uh, it's fairly case by case, uh, but at the very 
least I want to kind of plant this idea in your head that, uh, you know, zero risk is, is super expensive from a financial standpoint, despite all the issues I talked about, the product market risk, the labor market risk, et cetera. Uh, so some, some kind of rational cost benefit calculation needs to be had some kind of conversation around that uh, 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 you know uh, otherwise uh, you know it's like trying to insure against every risk that that's as you know impractical and expensive so there's lots to unpack here you know and uh, the, the team that we've put together uh, is i mean you know if i may say so myself i think mind boggling you know, so we have uh, David Simon, and uh, you know, from from Mayor Brown. This is one of the absolute top legal firms uh, who who help clients in uh, both you know, dealing with the legal issues and the business issues with respect to cyber. David Wong from uh, Mandian Consulting, uh, James Perry from CrowdStrike. So these are these are two companies that are on the forefront of tracking, detecting. And uh, you know, helping companies respond to some of these issues. So it would be interesting to 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 hear their perspectives and thoughts. We have uh, Ravi Malela, who's the CFO of First Hawaiian Bank, and uh, you know, Ravi will talk a little bit about the ROI uh, question. You know, how has uh, First First Hawaiian decided uh, where to put, you know, where where to invest and where not to? You know, how to have a rational conversation around dollars and money in this issue. Then we have uh, CP Janardhan, who's the who's a DVP at MasterCard, and I couldn't think of a better person to worry about cyber than than Jana, you know, because uh, look at the you know billions of transactions, not even million, billions of transactions that MasterCard has to process, and effectively give a yes or a no vote because uh, they're trying to worry about fraud, right? So, so there's some vendor sitting in Brazil or India who's sending them a ping, you know, somebody's presented a card, should I pay? Is this legitimate or is it not? So, you know, um, so it would be fascinating to listen to, you know, some of the best practices that MasterCard has come up with to manage this concern. And finally, we have uh, Vivek, who's our, uh, you know, he's also from Mayor Brown. Uh, Vivek will talk about the, uh, Vivek's a lawyer, so we'll talk about the legal and disclosure issues. And Rich Nolan at the end uh, uh, from, from Citibank, where uh, I think Rich will discuss, is this becoming a systemic risk or not? So, you know, lots to unpack. Uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to listening to these gentlemen and learning from them, uh, because this is an evolving area. Uh, things change very rapidly, uh, but the focus of the, the, the the course and the webinar is mostly managerial you know it's about it's 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 less from an engineering standpoint it's more of you know if, if you if, if you're in the c-suite if you're in the if you're senior management if you're on the board uh what should i do how should i you know a figure out the the, the extent of the threat what concrete uh cultural and other organizational responses can i put in place to fix this problem and uh you know how can I maintain this as, as I as I go on, and then we'll we'll have some conversation about the the the, the legal ethical issues about ransomware disclosure, uh, etc. So so let me stop now and uh, invite Scott back, and I'll put myself on mute. And I'm uh, you know I haven't been following the chat, but I'm just blown away by the interest. One ninety four participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. This is you know such a timely topic and you know your first slide that you showed with just October 2021 when I first saw that I thought oh that must be over a year but it was just literally over a month but I just want to start off with saying you know we're getting a lot of questions from you know executives from every area so large companies and small businesses and one of the things you said was that you know there, there's no one that can be untouched by this and it's equally as important for any company and, and not, I was writing furious notes you also wrote acceptable risk. So I want to couple the first question that came from Brittany, which is why should every executive be thinking about cybersecurity today, maybe in terms of that acceptable risk? Because I would think a smaller company would have a different reality about acceptable risk. And can they learn from the best practices of a larger company? Or would it not be a good learning because the acceptable risk is different? Yeah, great questions, Scott. Great questions. To me, 
let, let's start with total risk and then talk about acceptable risk. The total risk uh, to me is, you know, is, is actually higher in a small company for, uh, for the for the reasons we discussed, right? Uh, the, the, you know, the, the level of expertise that they can afford because of scale is lower. It's harder to find these crack cybersecurity folks to come work for you. In fact, these guys are so hard it's impossible to get them on the phone or, or, or on email nowadays. You know, they are, they're all making like seven-figure numbers. And uh, just, just getting their attention can be hard, let alone recruiting them. So, and the other issue is that, you know, if you don't have an in-house coding team, you're relying on somebody else's solutions uh, by definition, especially for software. And sometimes some of these solutions don't talk to each other. Uh, you're also, I would say, super exposed because you're, you're a small company. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to devote the resources to detect and manage responses and, on, coupled with the, the, the human capital problem, which we are all going through now. It's so hard to hire high quality people these days, especially in hot areas like cyber. So let's first talk about total risk and then we can talk about acceptable risk. Given the money we have, given the resources we have, can we have a rational, you know, systematic managerial risk management based response to this problem is 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 the conversation i'm you know hoping to encourage uh because it's it's as we said you know zero covid is not going to happen zero cyber is not going to happen it's only a matter of time we are all going to get infected perhaps both with covid and with cyber uh, you know so the parallels are i think quite interesting between those two things yeah and i i think there's a lot of questions that are coming in and i'm you know sort of putting them together in the sense that the fear for the entrepreneurs and the small businesses and, you know, that, that, are, that have to think about this is equally to larger companies. So I think the benefit of, um, you know, something you said about like a, a, a template for, of these engagements, a template that people use. My question when I was thinking about it and, and a few people have asked is that, you know, does the template then not become useful because cybersecurity attackers understand the template or, you know, it's it's such a broad. You know, what can companies do that don't have the resources? Are there is there going to be a general template that people can use? Are there going to be cybersecurity experts who will work in the small business realm and entrepreneur realm? Uh, so so there are off the shelf solutions you could buy if you're a small company. You know, because it's the the market is still not as continuous. Meaning, you know, is this only something? designed for the big folks well look if this if there's uh limited supply of talent it's probably going to go to the folks who pay the most so for now to some extent you're right you know it's the, the it's the large the large institutions that actually attract the the talent and the people uh but there are a few off the shelf solutions that you can use if you're a small company now the other point about what is the point of the template if the other side figures this out you know that that that's that's a bit overstated right i mean uh, if, if you, even if you have an arsonist who comes and sets fire to your building as long as you have a fire drill it's actually going to help you it's going to okay. minimize damage mm -hmm. it's going to save lives so there is almost this is a necessary condition there's almost no excuse to not have some kind of readiness procedure, you know, ignoring it is to me the biggest risk. Yeah, I agree. Uh, one of the things you brought up, and I see it on here, is you know your uh, customers hooked up in your system, employees working from home. I'm assuming that the the reality of the pandemic has exacerbated this reality with all of us. You know, this is you know I'm in my house now in the country, and I'm not in my office, and there's a reality to that. So one of the questions is is uh, from Muvik. He says. What is the role of the individual versus the organization when it comes to cybersecurity? Good hygiene, good hygiene, good hygiene. You know, just like you wash your hands to pre prevent COVID and it saves the entire ecosystem you live in. Uh, one of the biggest managerial challenges we have, you know, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about this from the board, the senior management issue, is how to, how to get everyone in the company to take this seriously. You know, that, that's actually a big organizational problem. So if you have a committed workforce that is already converted and sees the danger, wow, that's like, you know, remember, uh, Scott, I always say this in every, every webinar and class I do, engineering solutions are easy. Changing people's engineering here, which is culture and behavior, is super hard. So, you know, as long as that battle's won, 
look, they're in great shape. You know, if, if that, well, that's it's interesting because a, a question just popped in that said, this is not a new problem, right? And it's interesting that why do you think we're still educating the C-suite about cybersecurity and requirements for the investment they're in? And maybe in another part levels of the organization, what are, you know, they'll probably people want to know how can they stress the importance to the C-suite? Uh, so you know the answer to that, right? Who's in, who, who's, who's on the board? 65 plus people. Uh, so this is, this is a problem they sadly, I think, just don't under, necessarily appreciate or understand as much as they probably should. You know, uh, m- most folks are old, you know, they, I mean, no offense, but some of them can barely use an iPhone. You know, I have several senior uh, board members present in some of my classes. They, they freak out when they have to use Zoom. So without their secretary, they can't handle Zoom. They can't share slides. You know, it's okay. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a demographic problem, partly. Uh, so that may be at least one hypothesis behind why, uh, as, as the person asked, you know, why hasn't this been fixed? How is this being fixed? Increasingly, people are either buying expertise through consulting firms and or, uh, in fact, you know, putting 30-year-olds on the board who are actually experts on cyber, for instance. Right. Many boards have uh, cyber committees which are designed specifically to deal with this problem. Uh, and th- we should also emphasize, if I may, I think the, the, the COVID's actually been a, you know, COVID's done actually a lot of wonderful things, I must say. The working from home revolution to me is actually a huge positive. Uh, but COVID's also made hacking easier because a lot of the commerce went online. In fact, I often say COVID accelerated e-commerce by like seven or eight years. You know, my old mother in India who, who hates fiddling with this stuff, has no choice but to order groceries online. So it's brought a whole bunch of new users, sadly uneducated users in, 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 the, in this domain. Uh, and let's not forget the emergence of state actors. You know, it's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, without, without naming countries and so on. So, you know, the, the future wars are not going to be fought on the battlefield. They're going to be fought in the world of cyber. Yeah. So, okay. I, you know, we're I, I, there's so many good questions. Can I ask for a few minutes more of your time? Yeah. Yeah. Really sure. Want, sure. Sure. Yeah. I want to get to a couple more. So Paulo asks, what is the role of training the IT personnel of a company? You know, so, so remember, remember that story that I put up. Uh, you 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 probably loaded a patch and you you know gone off to Disneyland. Uh, do, do we have a process? For example, if you're an IT person, if, if something like that happens, uh, and if no one can log in, but look at the lost productivity here. It's huge, right? So sometimes, and this is, this is something we often, infl- we often face, right? You get siloed by your training and your function. So sometimes, potentially, I think the IT people don't quite understand what the users want. So some kind of empathy in trying to, you know, on, on several dimensions. One, many of your users are just naive. They're technically not as adept as you are. Uh, so some hand-holding, you know, s- s- some kind of empathy. And occasionally, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a slap on the wrist if you screw up. Uh, it, it's, so, you know, you need a, a, a managerial response from the IT perspective as well. A lot of the IT technicians, you know, at least in my, you know, limited uh, experience, sadly are not managers, they are technicians. Sometimes they don't see the big picture. They don't see the systemic problems that can possibly occur when something small like this happens. I mean, imagine if Amazon's website is down for 10 minutes. Right. What is the revenue impact on Amazon? Oh my God, right? right? So, you know, you, these are systems that can't afford that downtime. And forget Amazon, you may say it's too big and so on. But look, everybody has a website, it doesn't matter. A modest company, you're selling on Etsy, your website's down for a for a for a for a for a week. Wow, this is like real dollars, man. You know, uh, so so what's the what's the takeaway here? You know, IT people, a you know, don't be siloed if you possibly can. Right. Think about the customer. I mean, this is like I'm not giving you rocket science advice, but you know, advice is easier to give than to implement. Getting people to change is so hard. Uh, and maybe processes are one way to solve the problem because if you make it people dependent, you know, the good people trapped in bad systems by and large fail. Uh, but good systems can accommodate bad people too. So you need to invest in systems and processes, if you will. All right. All right. One uh, one more question, then I'll ask my final question. So Sandeep, and you sort of touched on this a little bit in the presentation, 
He asks, how do cyber attacks impact the stock market? Ah, I, I love that question. That's something I've studied a lot. You know, it's fascinating. Uh, by and large, it does nothing. And that's why I was kind of puzzled. So I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal a while back, and I can forward that to you if you, if you, if you, if you, if you care to look at it. Uh, when Yahoo went through a massive attack, and the stock market did absolutely nothing. And I'm puzzled about why that is. And I think that it's, that's because the losses get socialized. So if you're in a, if you're in a consumer-facing business, you know, let, 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 let's think about experience. That, you know, for, for folks in the U.S., you'll appreciate that. There was a massive attack on this uh, you know, on this agency that tracks our social security and our, and our credit histories. Who bore the cost? You and me, Scott. We had to get on the phone, make sure you block your uh, credit history, make sure nobody can open an account. In fact, the other day, I had a situation where somebody is claiming unemployment insurance from the state of New York on my account. And Columbia is calling me saying, what the heck? Are you, you looks like you're still employed. Why the hell are you claiming unemployment insurance? I have no idea. <laughs> Seriously, this is—I'm not making this up. This is a real story. Terrifying. So, it's—it's it's horrif it's horrifying. I'll give you one more story. This—this this is even more horrifying. So, you know, four or five years back, the IRS sent us a, a, a letter saying that your uh, returns have been hacked. So, what the bloody hell is going on? You know, IRS returns have been hacked. Well, you know, so I, I ran into one of the IRS commissioners in one of these conferences, and the commissioner tells me, "Look, my returns have been hacked too," and he's the IRS commissioner. Oh. So this is this is like ridiculous. It's it's out of control. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, going back to the stock market question, I think these losses get socialized. Individuals like you and me pay the price. If you want to go back in history and think a little bit, remember Ralph Nader. You know, so when in the early days of the automobiles, the fifties and the sixties, they would basically get the customer to sign a deal saying that you know if the brakes don't work, it's bloody your problem. If 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 the if the airbag doesn't show up, it's it's your problem. That's where we are with, with cyber companies today. When, I, when, you, when you say, I agree, I agree, I agree on Apple software or Microsoft software, you're effectively you know, absolving them of any legal responsibility. Mm. All right. So they are not responsible. You know? So yeah. uh, anyway, that, that's one hypothesis for why it happens. But the cyber shorting stuff is very worrisome to me, by the way. The, the other thing that we discussed, people actually shorting the stock and then uh, going and hitting you. Right. You know. All right. Well, I'm very excited. You know, you, I was in discussion with you about the upcoming uh, leading cybersecurity in your organization program. And what I like about it is it takes an overwhelming topic for leaders and it, you know, it's going to help them to think about the right questions and all that. So as I always do at the end of these webinars, you know, I always want to keep the energy going. I know the program's coming up, but I also want to keep the energy for all of those who attended today, you know, what can someone, what can a leader, what can anybody, because it's everybody's responsibility, do today? What would be something they could do today so this doesn't seem so overwhelming? Start the process. It's like exercise. I always postpone it. I'm going to do it tomorrow, right? <laughs> so start today with, with, with some baby steps, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, this may be a, you know, a bit of a plug, a shameless one, but th this, is, this is an amazing lineup, seriously. So, you know, a small investment in uh, you know, coming to listen to these folks would help. Uh, at least get the conversation going. You know, if, 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 if you are the CEO, you know, go tell your C-suite, come back to me in 30 days on a readiness plan. It's a start. We have to, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know that, right? So waiting for something great to happen, is kind of almost too late. So get, get some awareness going, get some conversation going, start today. Think about a readiness plan. And it sounds like one of the things you said, which I loved, is, is break down those traditional silos within your organization because this is going to affect everybody. So that you know, every part of the organization understands the reality of every part of the organization and the company. You know what I mean? So that's a big thing. I think you're going to have to use talent differently to combat this. <laughs> you know? Oh, especially that's a huge issue, as, as we all know. You know, we also have electronic silos. That's why we have a Facebook problem. Right. Yeah. So the like-minded people talk to the like-minded people. It's 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 a human issue, you know. Right. And it, it's 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 eternal. And hopefully, technology can solve some of that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Shiva, Raj Kapal. It's always great to work with you. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today on behalf of Columbia Business School Executive Education, Professor Raj Kapal, myself. Thank you for joining us at the very center of business. Thank you, Scott. Thanks everyone for coming.